past few days, I've been riding a Cannondale Motera 3 on some incredible trails here in the Los Sierra in Northern California. But as we'll see, this is possibly one of the most tricked out Cannondale Moteras you will ever come across. Now the stock Cannondale Motera comes with 160 mil travel, front and rear, and 29 inch wheels, but there is simply nothing left on this bike from its original stock form. Everything has been changed, such things as the amount of suspension, the linkage, the wheels, the tires, the incredible brakes, as I've found out, the cranks, seat posts, and even the battery has gone from 500 watt hours to 625. Now, before I introduce you to the man behind this incredible bike, I just want to point out that I've actually ridden it with a 200 mil triple clamp forks and also 180s. But here he is from Northern California, Craig Corwin. Craig. How are you doing? Nice to see you. Thanks so much Thank for you. letting me ride your bike over the last few days. Uh, it is it is a significant change, improvement to the standard stock bike, right? Yes. I'm sure most people will notice, first of all, that the uh, suspension travel on it has gone up to 180 mil front on this particular bike, with a single, cr single crown, and also 185 travel on the Correct. back, Correct, just right? maybe a hair shy of it, about, yeah, 185, yeah. just to round it out. So how, I mean, the first question is, how did you actually accomplish the, the, the increase in suspension travel? So, I mean, obviously with the fork, that was pretty straightforward. Uh, with the rear, it is a link off of a, another Cannondale model that was an actual acoustic, whatever you call it, you know, a pedal bike. Yeah. And it's just got a different pickup point for the seat stay, and the leverage ratio changed, so it made the shock actually more supple, more like a spring, more tunable, and the increased wheel travel. So this linkage on the back here, it's something you can buy off the shelf? It is, if you knew it existed, yeah. You can, <laughs> yeah, but most people don't even, it was how I approached it was, I just looked at a lot of uh, the bikes on Cannondale's site and looked at the, you know, see like that looks very similar. So I contacted Tim Eaton of Cannondale. I said, hey, can you get me these part numbers? So I just send me all these different part numbers. Yeah. So I've actually used several different links. This isn't the only one I've used. But hey, Presto, you've got the bike. Now, uh, the other significant change, that rear linkage is also enabled you to do one of the second big changes on, the, on this bike, which is go from 29-inch wheels to 29, 27.5 on the rear, right? Correct. And it not only did that, you know, allowed me to get the head angle, obviously, where I wanted it when I went with the 180 fork, but it also provided a couple other things. With the ratio of that linkage, it allowed for a much more supple breakaway uh, yeah. that the air shock kind of suffers from and more tunability of the shock, and it allowed the increase of the rear wheel travel to about 185. Yeah. Um, but the geometry changes aren't actually as big as many people would think. They you know, really you, aren't. You, you know, 160, no, 185 is... So we've gone from a bottom bracket of, I think it's st three, three... Stock is actually 350. On their yeah. spec sheet, it's not correct. It says 360, but it's yeah. actual bottom bracket is 350. Yeah. But we've now got 361, right? 362. 362 Correct. and a 64 head angle. Correct. Which is slacker than the 66 stock. Correct. So you mentioned about stiction earlier. I think most people will actually see one of the big features of this bike is the bypass um, valve up front. Correct. Uh, talk us through the thinking about this, Corwin. So that, that kind of gets in depth a little bit, but it's just, just a lot of basic stuff. It's just the way a lot of forks work you know, the Fox has come out with a pinch bolt, which is moto style, which is uh, amazing. It's the way it should be. When you have a fork that actually bolts together like some of the other brands do where there's not a floating axle, it tends to bind the fork. So when I do a fork, I ask the person to provide me with the front wheel that's gonna be in it and that hub. So when I take the fork apart, take it completely apart, seals all out of it, um, clean all the grease out of it and start actually twisting and bending the stanchions and the lowers to get that fork to when I put it together, it's, it's there's that. no stiction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of these forks, you take them apart, all the seals out of it and it's clean and you can take and put the lower on the stanchions and turn it upside down, they won't even yeah. fall off. So it's pointless, pointless sort of tuning a fork pointless. If, if, if the sort of 
the basic mechanics of it aren't lined up, right? Correct, because there's no repeatability. You can never reproduce what you thought you yeah. had. So what you do then, you, I think what you mentioned earlier, you, you blueprint the fork, right? Correct, so that's the, that's the starting point, is yeah. making sure everything is true, and then when you bolt the front wheel into there and tighten everything up, it stays that way. Because yeah. a lot of times you'll bolt a wheel in and it won't move anymore. Yeah. So we get that done first. The second part is, um, is drilling it and doing the bypass on it. Mm -hmm. And the bypass is a tube that goes from the bottom of the left lower leg over to the bottom of the right lower leg. And the reason for that is, is you have a lot less volume in the left side because the air shaft is in the bottom of the stanchion, so there's a pocket down there. That pocket ramps up at a really high rate that you can't control. So it tends to pr produce a fork that may feel supple, but it's not. Once it gets down the stroke, it just spikes. I will say, folks, I've ridden this bike through some pretty varied terrain in the last few days. I've gone through rock, massive rocks, rock. roots, high speed, low speed. And I have to say, it is super supple call. It's play. pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing is, you know, like on, in Fox, especially, they have a lot of oil on their lowers. I tend to run a lot less, barely any, to produce more volume to create less ramp up. Also, by having that crossover, it kills that pressure in the left lower side, but also puts more in the right side, which will help with shear. Because we have a bike, you know, with a fork that's being supported by one side, which wants to shear it and bind it. So there's an imbalance in the fork. Imbalance yeah. in the fork. So that helps it some. It doesn't fix it 100%, but it makes it a lot better. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, uh, I rode this bike with the 180 single crown, but also, as you can see on our left here, is a similarly um, tricked out fork in Same triple process. clamp. Uh, well, I was quite blown away. It's actually the same axis of the crown, isn't it? On, same, the, on the yeah. 200 mil fork compared to it the 180 mil fork. Yeah, what we use on here is just a little angle spacer that's about 10 millimeters thick that gives it the exact same axle to crown height. So it is no different yeah. geometry as far as rate goes. Yeah, but the big difference is in the offset. We've got yes. a 58 mil offset on the, on, the, uh, on the 49 and we've got a 51 mil offset, yes. I think, on the Correct. 38, right? Correct. And it has been quite interesting riding the bikes. <clears throat> I mean, personally, I think it comes down to the type of riding you do. If you're riding sort of steep, techy climbs, you do need the sort of single the crown. The turning radius. The turning radius, yes. which you haven't got with, with, the, with the triple correct. clamp. But nevertheless, when you ride that, it, it's it a performs way... pretty well. It's kind of, people are going to probably look at that and go, no, but you rode it. Yeah. And to talk about, you know, internals of the fork again, both these forks are done the same way. The valving in the cartridges is stock. The cartridge just comes apart and gets a really super, super lightweight oil in it. So both of these forks are running in the middle of their compression and rebound adjustment where you can actually use it and tune it, where a lot of times you might run it wide open. So they're both very supple and you rode them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I think it's, it comes down to a, pref a personal preference type Correct. terrain. It does, ride. for sure. Um, so moving on now, uh, Colin, to maybe the middle of the bike, we've got the, the Bosch uh, fourth generation motor in there. It comes stock with a 500 watt hour battery, this bike. Correct. You've modded it up to 625. Is I that did. an easy job? Yeah, it was really easy. I mean, this bike, I, I started with a Motera 3 because I knew I was basically going to gut it. So I just didn't need any of the components that came on it, but it came with a 500 battery. Very simple to convert. The tray, caddy, whatever you may want to call it in the frame, it just, you take the unit, head unit out where the plug is and you just move it up to a pre-existing set of holes that are there. So it's just pull it out, move it, bolt it back in, put it back in. Yeah. Maybe adjust your lock setting so it's tight. Well, it is pretty significant because- Pretty I, easy. Yeah, I mean, the frame, is, it's, a, it's the same carbon frame. Yeah, same I'm frame. I'm guessing that's on the one as well, right? Same, the one, the two, three, all the same. Yeah, uh, moving down now to the bottom bracket. This is the first time I've actually ever ridden 150 mil crank. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> that when people might ask, excuse me, how, yeah. how short are those? <laughs> I know. You meant 160. No, but, we meant you know, 150. I, I found it was, I found it, I think it's smoother. It is smoother. It's, and that is something you can go down a rabbit hole talking about that, but it's your legs are like pistons in an engine. And the farther that gets out, your, your legs are just spinning faster and faster to produce the same RPM at the bottom bracket. Um, so what I did with this is, you know, I experimented with the 150 cranks before, then kind of went nah, and then I thought about it and came back to it. And then I put them back on and I actually re-geared it with a different front chain ring. So I went from the stock 34 tooth chain ring to a 32. And theory behind that is, is it's not so much the actual crank length from where the 
pe you know the pedal mounts to the bottom bracket is the distance between where the pedal is and where the chain actually is, like how big the front gear is. Mm -hmm. So by putting on a smaller front chain ring, you basically made it have more leverage, but you slowed down how your cadence is and how it rides and how it reacts. Um, have you experimented with the, uh, the crank lens? Like, you oh, know, I have. Yeah? Yeah, 165s, 160s. Yeah. yeah, I didn't go past 165. 165 was getting to the point where you got up out of the saddle and wanted to stand up and pedal over something and wheelie it. The bike was just kind of flailing all over because your legs were moving so far. Yeah. So it made it way smoother over more technical yeah. terrain. So we've got a bike here, which is longer travel, which means it's going to be more capable of descending. Yes. We've got the cranks, which means ascending is going to be improved. You've got the, 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 the uh, ground clearance. Mm -hmm. um, what about slowing this bike down, Colin? Slowing it down. Slowing it, it slows down, down pretty well, I, <laughs> I think. Say, I yeah. say it slows down pretty damn, yeah, for yeah. sure. I think possibly one of the best brakes I've ever ridden on an e-mountain bike. They're pretty crazy. It's, um, so the, foot, the brake here is the Magura... Magura MT7HC3. The MT7 and the MT7HC3 are essentially the same brake. The MT7HC3 comes with a fully adjustable lever. Yeah. So the beauty of Magura that I like, it's more motorcycle MotoGP style. It's a radio master cylinder, not an axial. So the leverage ratio is more, it's direct straight into it. These levers have adjustments to move the contact in or out on the piston to make the brake more powerful or less powerful. And it's a it's an adjustment of probably about eight millimeters of movement, but you can set it anywhere in that range. And then the reach of the lever too. And it, it, are, are these brakes totally stock on? No, they uh, are not. Ob so, obviously, yeah, obviously not. Yeah, no. Obviously not. Uh, no. So everything <laughs> on here has been touched or massaged <laughs> in some way. Um, it's running um, 220 millimeter rotors front and rear. Yeah. A big thing that's kind of Hard to explain to people will probably grasp if I explain it is sweep area. And what sweep area means is where the actual brake pad is running on the surface of the rotor. And if everyone out there is looking at their rotors, they'll probably go out and look at them. Yeah. So the idea behind this is you want the pad to be down on this type of rotor as close to the actual uh, carrier mm -hmm. or, you know, as it can be, because the problem is if they don't, and a lot of them don't just based on mass production, parts, variances, and things of that nature. So these mounts have all been machined to get the calipers lower to get the sweep area down to the bottom of the rotor. Another thing it does is if you run your bike in stock form brake, usually you'll see that there's a slot in the rotor and the pad isn't covering it, it's running yeah. through it. Yeah. And it, it chews the pads up really quick. It also produces a flutter and maybe even a, a pulsation in the brakes, yeah. noisy. What about pads? Stock pads on it? Pads in here is the sport compound, which is green. So there's two higher you can go. So, you know, knowing that you rode on it, that you still have more aggressive pads yeah. to step up to. Um, I, I'm, pads, gonna go I'm gonna go home and try and get hold of that. They're brakes. crazy. Yeah. They're really good brakes. Yeah, I'm um, like 95 kilos and, and, and they just slowed you down like so quietly and effortlessly. You just dabbed around the corner, away to go. Yeah. Uh, and you know you didn't have to you didn't have to drag the brakes at all. It's no. literally scrubbed the speed so quickly. Uh, actually, Corwin, tell us talk us about what uh, Corwin Motorsports is all about. So I mean, I have a history in a lot of things I've messed with. Whatever I get into, I get into it at a pretty pretty deep, out of control rate, <laughs> um, obsessive behavior. <laughs> But as of now, business is about 70% moto, I mean, yeah. dirt bike stuff. So I do race motors for people, tuning, a lot of stuff like that. Um, and then with the e-bike thing, it's probably turned into about 30% of that. And it's, I think, growing at a pretty good rate. Yeah, it seems and to me that the e-bikes here in, the, in California- is I'm, pretty crazy. Yeah, we rode some trails, which I didn't think you could ride. I mean, there's a perception yeah. maybe outside North America you can't ride e-bikes in a lot of places. It's, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's incredible. It's pretty incredible. And finally, Corwin, let's talk rims and tires. Your rims and tires. <laughs> so this is definitely outside the box. <laughs> the rear rim is a 45 millimeter rim. Inside uh, or outside diameter? Yes, inside. Yeah. So repeat, 45, not 30, 35. <laughs> and the front is a 35 millimeter inside width. Yeah. Um, it's pretty extreme, not the norm but I like what it does to the tire profile. Okay. On the back, you know, sidewall support, 
What have uh, we got on the back here? It says it's a WTB. That's a, that's a WTB verdict. Yeah. Uh, 2.5 tough casing. Uh, and in the front, we have a Vigi 2.5 tough casing as well. And they're, they're high grip tires. Um, they it's work funny, pretty when well. I, when I rode it, I did, like, I've ridden sort of the, the wider rims before and they didn't tell them to fall over in the corner. But obviously it's not just the rim, is it? It's no, the it's things not. as the bottom bracket it's, and the wheel it's size everything. and the chain stay. All of it. Definitely something I think I'm gonna explore with when I get home there, Colin. Yeah, I think when someone does something, you have to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Just don't throw one component on there and say it didn't work. You know, yeah. look at your geometry. Did it change? Is it still the same? Were you able to get the head angle back? Like when, when we did the fork swap and talked about it, yeah. you know, all we did was change <laughs> offset and lose a little travel. Yeah. We had the exact same Axle to crown height, uh, same geometry. Yeah, I mean, that alone changed the handling of the bike yeah. dramatically. It's different. Very, very differently. Yeah. Uh, so folks, there you go. Uh, a super uh, insightful look there into, into a bike, which I think arguably one of the most uh, tricked out e-mountain bikes I've ever come across. So Thank check you. out uh, Craig Corwin at Corwin Motorsports, Motorsports for uh, any major upgrades yes. on your mountain bike. Yeah, something, something crazy. Yeah. Colin, thanks for joining us. And, thank you. And thank you for letting yeah. me kind of, you know, get a look and a ride on, on some, some great stuff. You're quite welcome. Thank, thank you. you.